this. Um, you know, if there is no real way of adding more land or clearing more land, um, if you are somewhere like Cox's Bazaar, uh, what are the other main behavior changes that we can uh, try and promote? Um, what other actions can we take, undertake? And, and is there a role for site planning, not in terms of sort of, you know, big roads through the middle of the camp, but in terms of sort of smaller interventions here and there, which might give a little nudge to any of that behavioral change, any of that learning, any of the other support activities uh, from the camp management side. And I think you're on mute, Dan. Thanks. Um, I think behavior change is, uh, you know, it, it's problematic to assume that behavior change is the solution when there's no option for space. Um, that's that's not necessarily the role of behavior change is, is a last resort measure where we've exhausted all other options. So we're going to look to behavior change, um, especially when you consider the sort of behaviors we're expecting of people in space. So we did take that approach in, in Cox Bazaar. We, we site planners were actively involved in the construction of hand washing facilities, uh, outside distribution points, and the distribution points themselves, you know, it started to enforce social distancing within the spaces. Um, but, but quite honestly, in the, in the consultations we had with people, uh, you know, many Rohingya pointed out, like, look, now we just have a, a, a bigger crowd outside the distribution point. So now there's a massive crowd outside the distribution point that isn't, you know, respecting social distancing um, whatsoever. So, uh, you know, to what extent um, are behavior changes like measures actually feasible? I think I think that was something that that we often ignored because we felt like there wasn't there wasn't really much. I mean, an, another repeated complaint was that, you know social distancing was was often you know reminded to refugees when they were encouraged to socially distance while they're replying to us how can i socially distance in a in a five square meter shelter that has eight people in it that's not social distancing um so so i would say COVID actually really revealed here um that that what needed to happen was actually the behaviors that that were feasible and possible needed to have been identified by the community and, and that didn't actually happen. What, what happened was that we copied the same behavior change messaging that rolled out globally, and we applied it to one of the world's most congested refugee camps without really thinking about whether that advice and guidance was applicable or practical, given, given kind of the conditions where you have people waiting outside of toilets to use the toilets and people waiting outside water taps even to gather water. I, I can't really think of a space in the camps where I can go to have a private conversation Right, and if that's not possible, then how is this right? How am I social distancing whatsoever? Um, so I, I would say that's um, that that was I think the major learning is that that really when I think COVID is an unprecedented challenge um, for the humanitarian machinery, um, and I, I think we really failed to to maybe take a moment to ask ask populations right. Here's the challenge you're going to be faced with what would you identify as reasonable actions for you to take? Some people did come forward with actions that they did wanna take. Um, some were feasible from a site planning perspective, many were not. Um, many people wanted all the quarantine facilities, isolation facilities to be constructed in a camp where there's no space for them. Um, you know, Many people wanted to see like expansion of shelters and plots, which we didn't have space for. Um, but rather than sit down and hash that out um, with the population, I think what, what largely happened was you know, site planners rolled ahead with a with a series of, of interventions that that kind of they saw work, and then the community actually ultimately decided for themselves what to do at the end of the day, and whether to seek out services like quarantine or isolation. And ultimately, I think we saw a lot of those programs uh, really not succeed, um, simply because the community didn't really feel the behaviors or, or the the facilities constructed um, were actually for them and, and would help them. Mm. Yeah, no, I think it, it's it's very interesting. I mean, can I be provocative and say, would you have done anything differently if you could go back in time to March? Uh, would be the one thing that you would have done differently kicking off in March or April? Um, I, I, you know, it's, it's hard for me to answer that because uh, our work was actually about sharing that discontent 
And so we did, we did say that people were telling us beforehand that they did not intend to quarantine. They did not intend to socially distance because they didn't think it was possible. And, and these concerns were largely ignored. Um, I, I don't really know how we could have translated that better into operational actions. I think the whole response felt we had to do something. Um, and unfortunately, the things that the, the population actually wanted were for services to continue. They said these services, the wash services, the distributions that you're providing, those are important. We would like those to continue uh, regardless of the COVID response. And, the, and they pointed out that, that elderly populations die in the camp every year from communicable diseases. And they didn't really make much of a differentiation between the threat of COVID and, and the kind of existing epidemiological problem of the camps. Um, I don't know, you know, I, I think at right in that rush and that madness to get everything ready, and we we had some months to prepare what would have made a difference in 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 our decision making processes. I, I would just say really going into it, we needed to have a much stronger connection, basis of trust, and inclusion of refugees in decision making processes to in order to have avoided it. And unfortunately, we we did not have that at the time. There's a side question from Eric who I'm wanting to bring back in anyway. Just quickly, what has been the uh, the, the infection rate in Fox's how, how severe has the, has the problem been? You're asking Eric, correct? No, I'm asking you, Eric's. Ah, so so the, the problem is, is um, is that we don't know. So that the refugees actually refuse to come forward and even seek testing. The, the testing rates, there's only been 300 confirmed cases. However, anecdotally, um, we, we, we did reveal a large number of, of flu-like illnesses sweeping through the camps um, May to June uh, because people didn't want to come forward to testing because testing led to forced quarantine um, against people's wishes. Uh, most people just, this is why uh, facility visits fell by over 75%. Um, so it, it's still really hard for us to determine what the actual rate of exposure has been but, but we're talking about a, a, a country that went through the, the COVID epidemic uh, in, in roughly the same period of time at high rates. So I, I can't give you the exact numbers, but just to show you the confirmed cases is 326. So it's, I mean, something is a bit off with the testing, I think we mm. can say. Yeah. Um, I, I do want to use this as an excuse to bring Eric in. Um, and maybe it's because I'm looking over the top of my laptop at a very cold gray day here in Northern Europe, but also thinking about how different standards might actually be at first glance going against each other. But we have some standards for uh, keeping people warm, uh, you know, making sure that, uh, that there are closed shelters, that people have privacy, dignity, warmth. Um, and yet we also have standards that speak to um, reducing transmission to public health, things like that. Um, Eric, how can we uh, how can we try and reconcile uh, those needs um, of keeping spaces enclosed and keeping them not enclosed at the same time? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, your, I mean, what your standards are for the shelter cluster for various things, I'm not quite sure. I'm just aware of the sort of, well, you need a certain amount of space per person stuff, but I'm, I'm not sure really, it's, I'm not to speak about all the other standards, but I mean, for sure, you know, if you're in a sort of colder climate, I was just thinking here, you know, warmer climates, easier to ventilate, um, colder climates, not so easy, because you need to heat and ventilate without losing that heat. So if you've got a humanitarian emergency in a colder climate with coronavirus, it's, you're a bit more scuppered than maybe in Cox's Bazaar, where I'm, I'm presuming, having not been there, but people, you can open the windows and there's a lot of th through flow ventilation in these places as well. Um, another thing that just came to mind is, well, uh, we might not have had, uh, I was just asking in the chat there, what the mortality rate was in Cox's Bazaar from COVID. Presumably we'd know that, but it seems like in a lot of these places with a younger demographic, so Madagascar, for example, where uh, our guys there, they, they've had very few cases uh, there very few deaths and it just I'm just thinking well maybe some of these countries that have don't have many older people because well they've all died off because died early rather than just staying around for a while um, fewer obese fewer with other complicated diseases um, and they sort of get through this easier so for this particular virus it's maybe a specific thing for uh, 
countries with a different demographic and maybe a different climate. But I'm not sure how easy it is to make sweeping statements for standards. Because um, mm. it's this virus, and, not, and what about the next virus? Maybe it's not going to be a, respir a respiratory one. Um, but I think overall, we know that, you know, with, with a respiratory virus, ventilation is good, uh, generally good. Um, with a non-respiratory or respiratory one, either way, you know, good, good hand hygiene and good uh, sort of nudges for people to do something. So signage, for example, or zoning in, pub in, in public buildings or health centers. This is a good idea. So, you know, the zoning idea works in Ebola, in SARS-1, SARS-2, you know, this kind of thing. Um, so I suppose it would be more a case of like, if it's a respiratory virus, then thinking about ventilation. Now, I don't know if there is a ventilation standard for closed spaces yet. Um, um, I mean, mm -hmm. certainly in the UK, we have um, ventilation standards for non-COVID, just for indoor air quality standards, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, the, the ventilation rate we need for, for, for COVID transmission is slightly more than what would be for building standards. But, um, you know, maybe there's something along those lines. I don't know what you have in there already. Yeah, uh, there is no one which is you know, number of, of cubic meters of air moving or anything like that. Um, but talking all public also accessibility, um, Mohammed, maybe I can bring you in. Um, there's been some discussions in the chat on the side uh, about whether the role that site planning can play, if there is space, is to start looking at decentralization. Um, having more scattered, uh, maybe smaller, health posts, distribution centers, things like that. And that might help also with questions of people accessing or being willing to access uh, some of those facilities. Uh, Mohammed, what do you think about that? Should we be looking at a radical decentralization of health facilities or what else can we do? So normally in RDP camps, in our context, is more like we have uh, rapid response teams uh, to deal with COVID. And also we have the mobile medical teams who also take care of uh, people living in a scattered locations. So that's uh, one of the strategy which we have adopted in the last, uh, since start of the COVID, to mobilize those uh, rapid response team or mobile uh, medical teams to reach to population where they have access challenges and they have long distance to come to the health facilities. In some areas, the health facilities are away from camp. So that's a strategy. And then specific to COVID, we also, uh, the partners uh, specifically from IOM, uh, IOM, the uh, CCCM and Shelter, they also contributed to construct uh, quarantine centers in IDP camps so where the people, they were coming during the lockdown from different urban areas, from big cities. And there was a risk that uh, associated with those people who are entering in IDP camps and coming from high risk areas, uh, like big cities where COVID cases were were, were, were uh, quickly transmitting. So th those different strategies and also the green zone strategy to put population, people like the vulnerable groups, elderly, uh, disabled, pregnant women, people with chronic medical conditions in, in separate or uh, uh, dedicated sectors are zone in the camp. So, so you can protect and you can uh, somehow uh, restrict their engagement or their their uh, interaction with the rest of the camp population. But overall, we have like in our context, we have the the health clinics in most of the uh, almost all the IDP camps. Uh, but COVID is a is a different uh, type of I mean needs more different type of uh, treatment and also it needs isolation facility which is a spe specific uh, treatment facility. You have to follow all those treatment protocols and all those things to infection prevention, etc. So it needs more, um, more decentralized is, is, is a good approach also, but where in locations where you don't have a uh, um, facility, or you don't have resources to manage that. So you can look for alternate solution like mobile teams. Mm. No, thanks very much. I think we've got about 30 seconds to go. Um, does anybody want to stick up their hand quickly and say, well, what about the camp managers? Um, Elena, your hand went up before you knew what the question is. Elena, what about the, hand, what about the camp managers? No, I just wanted to contribute to the previous one because it was a question if on neighborhood level, like uh, breaking to a smaller market, if that works. So I, I think then it comes to the, you know, health facilities, we need the still centralized system and mobile kind of clinics. But then it comes to the markets, it really worked in the urban areas to breaking it to the smaller 
actually play, places and especially distribution of, of food for, for the vulnerable ones, distribution of information. It helps also to actually work out with the community kids because they know each other better. They also protect and they care about each other. You know, they're the source of the information who is actually sick. And, and this is the way of a bit of contributing to the change of the behavior just bringing it to the smaller communities that people feel uh, more aware of each other and uh, taking care of each other than the facilities cannot come in. Mm. And I guess I think you know where camp management does have a role is actually that consultation process. You can't scatter everything all at the same time, um, especially if it's a choice of congested land. Um, and consulting and saying, we would rather have a localized community centre, a localised small market, a localised child-friendly space, and we'll use it for different other things as we go along, but this is our own preference. Um, we're getting, I think, more or less to the break time one, is, is that correct? Or do we have time for one more question? One. I think for Charlie to... Uh... But just to say, I think there are a couple of really interesting points in the chat that we should we should perhaps acknowledge that are coming through, even if we don't have a, a time to answer them now. So um, there was a question for Mohammed about how feasible it is to separate such a big part of the population, um, which I, th I think is a really big question to be dealt with. Um, and, and a couple of other points in there about um, one's point about discouraging separation and then a new a new point in there from Antoinella too so if you haven't had a chance to look at the chat please do um, we after the break we're going to be going into breakout rooms um, and uh, I want you to have a little think about that so I'm going to ask Patricia to put up a, a slide to help us with that but before I do I just want to thank all of our panelists and Jim for a, a really fascinating conversation I think we had uh, probably the greatest involvement in people feeding into the chat, which is always a strong sign that the conversation was interesting and engaging for everyone. So thank you for everyone who, who was involved. Um, Patricia, do we have that slide showing the, the different breakout groups for the afternoon? It's coming. So the reason we want to show this slide is because we want you to select if you are interested in joining one of these four particular groups. So the way it's going to work is we're going to start a break in a few minutes. Um, and during the break, we're going to try to allocate you to one of these rooms. That's quite a time consuming process. So if you don't mind which room you are, you join, then you needn't say anything or do anything now. But if you particularly like to join one of those rooms, then please note it down in the chat now. Just indicate in the chat which of the rooms you'd like to join, um, and we will do our best to put you into those rooms. When we come back from the chat, uh, we'll go straight into the breakout rooms. Um, so we'll be, we'll be going to do that now, but it is just about 10 to the hour now. So take, take a break now, and if you could come back on the hour, um, that's three o'clock if you're on Geneva time or whichever other hour if you're not. And we will see you for a discussion on these topics. Have a good break.